Welcome to today's program about buckling. I've just pulled over a car for acting kind of a little bit unstable on the road. You're gonna join me as we investigate the situation a little further. Excuse me, sir. I pulled you over because your car was acting a little unstable on the road and I'm concerned we could have some buckling issues here. I'm gonna to need to see your license and registration as well as your learning objectives. Yes, sir, I understand. Let me give you my license and my registration, but to do the learning objectives, I will need to go to the trunk. And here are the learning objectives you requested. Today, I would like you to explain buckling and provide examples. Then derive the differential equation for buckling from equilibrium and then solve it, solve some basic problems using that differential equation. Lastly, I want you to be able to calculate effective length factors and then use them to solve engineering problems. But do you remember your boundary conditions? And of course I remember my boundary conditions. I can explain buckling to you, it's very easy. You probably already know how buckling works. You have something like this. Anybody who's been on a boring date, who's sat there and played with their straw, they know what buckling is. Whenever we have a member of significant length, right, and we apply a load, we know that it's going to bend something like this. We say that buckling, firstly, is a instability of the member that results in bifurcation of equilibrium. What does that mean? That means that our column can be perfectly straight like this and I could apply a load or at the same time it could be bent and I could apply that same load and from equilibrium both equilibrium states are possible. That's what we mean by bifurcation, two possible equilibrium states. We also know that buckling is a failure mechanism for compression members. I think that's pretty clear and it results in a bending or a twist or a local crushing of the cross section. See, I know what buckling is. Now do you? All right, so in case you didn't catch that with my crazy accent, let's go ahead and get the definitions for buckling into our notes. So we said that buckling is the instability of the member resulting in a bifurcation of equilibrium. And again, we broke that word down. Bifurcation means there's two possible equilibrium states. There's the state where the column or the member remains perfectly straight, or there's a case where the column or the compression member buckles. So those are the two or the, you know, two possible equilibrium states or the bifurcation of equilibrium. Uh, next, we noted that buckling is a failure mechanism. Uh, for members under compression loading. So I think we all have that general intuitive response to what buckling is. Uh, we know buckling is not good, and uh, so we recognize it in uh, engineering as a failure, a uh, failure of that member to hold the compression loading that it's subjected to. Finally, uh, we said that buckling results in a bending, a twist, or a local crushing of the cross section. So one of the ways you can kind of remember this, I always think of like my knee, unfortunately. Uh, if you put your knee in a bad spot, right, your knee will buckle, your knee will bend, it will twist. Um, uh, hopefully it doesn't local crush, that would be awful. Um, but anyhow, that's kind of one of the ways I remember how uh, buckling can occur. Uh, to give you an example of a project where I looked at buckling, I want to tell you a little bit about my PhD research. So check that out here. All right, so I want to take you through some of the research I did. I did my uh, PhD research at the University of Texas in Austin. And uh, broadly speaking, uh, the research pertained to cross frames in steel bridges. And I'm going to talk today about the buckling of those cross frame members. All right, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the sponsors for this research. So thank you, uh, Texas Department of Transportation, for sponsoring this, as well as my research supervisors, Dr. Helwig, Dr. Engelhart, and Dr. Frank. I learned so much from you guys. I'd uh, also like to thank the other people that helped out on these projects, as well as the staff at the Ferguson Structural Engineering Lab at the University of Texas in Austin. All right, so what are cross frames is probably what you're thinking. So 
Have you been under a steel bridge lately? If not, I would definitely recommend you find one and get yourself under it. Uh, but when you look up, you'll see these braces that connect the, the girders together. These braces are what we call cross frames. Cross frames and steel bridges act as torsional braces to help prevent girder buckling by forcing adjacent girders to twist as a unit. So if we take a look at the picture on the right, we see that two of these girders or three of these girders have flipped on their side because they buckled and they were able to uh, rotate uh, and unfortunately they fell down. Uh, so this is not what we want. We want our girders to stand strong. To increase their capacity, if we link them together using cross frames or even just using struts, we can increase the total buckling capacity of the system by forcing all the beams to twist as one unit. So you can see the picture on the left, which is actually from uh, the 19th Street overpass uh, of US 87 in Lubbock. Uh, you can see that these six girders across are linked together with cross frames at all those locations, helping to uh, prevent lateral torsional buckling. All right, part of our research is we wanted to improve the fundamental behavior of these cross frames by investigating alternative details. And to do that, we first had to understand the current performance of cross frames and strength, stiffness, and fatigue, and then look at the other details. So here we have some of the current details. Uh, we have the X frame and the K frame. Uh, we're sticking kind of with the letters here. The X, the brace makes an X. So if you look at the bottom one. If you turn your head to the left 90 degrees, you'll see the letter K, uh, hence the name K-frame. Uh, we were proposing some alternative details such as the Z-frame, uh, either made by using tubes or double angles. And we also looked at the current X-frame detail, but uh, perhaps utilizing unequal leg angles instead of uh, equal leg angles. To test these in stiffness, we developed this uh, setup. Uh, the blue, or where we have the letter R, those are our reactions. So you can see at the bottom right, I have a pin. The bottom left, I have a roller. And then the hydraulic cylinders or actuators are applying the forces as shown in orange. So basically, we're creating a torque or a moment we're applying a moment to this cross frame or a torque, and we're going to see how the cross frame responds. So here are just some pictures from the different types of tests. So this is the single angle X frame. So you can see one of the diagonals goes into compression, and that is the one that buckles first. So you can see it's starting to buckle. And then as it buckles, it loses its ability to handle additional compression loading, and it sheds some of that load to the top strut. Same for the K frame. Uh, we see that the diagonal that goes into compression starts to buckle, and there you have it. We have some sort of buckling failure. We can look at the unequal leg angle X-frame. Uh, it does something similar to the first X-frame we looked at, where the diagonal buckles and the strut nearest it buckles. And then we kept actually twisting this one, and uh, we ended up putting the top strut there in compression as well, and so that created uh, another buckled member. Uh, let's look at a couple of the double angle Z frames. So this one you can see it's not easy to tell, um, but it kind of buckles in the plane of the frame. So there is a shift. Uh, and then in this one we see that compression diagonal is buckling up. You can even see a little bit of a local buckling or local crushing of that member in the center. Kind of like a crinkle. And finally, we have a local buckling failure in the square tube, where you see just the tube. Um, because the tube usually has a slender cross-section uh, compared to its length, we often see this kind of crinkling happen in the tube. So this would be example, a good example of a local buckling failure. All right, so that shows you one of the applications of buckling. Of course, we have many applications of buckling out there in engineering, uh, but I thought this one was fun because I, I have, can give you some personal uh, insight into it. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to point out is that the single angle cross frames, any member cross frames with single angles, end up experiencing a reduction in stiffness because the centroid of the angle and the centroid of the gusset plate 
connecting uh, the cross frame to the bridge, because those center of gravities are not in a line, we have an eccentricity, and that eccentricity leads to a reduction in stiffness that is not typically accounted in our analytical or our line element solution. So we need to modify our, you know, just a basic uh, analysis approach. We need to modify that stiffness to account for the eccentric bending of the single angle members. Uh, the other concentric members that are shown uh, the last two cases, those analytical solutions match pretty well with our uh, models. All right, so I hope you enjoyed taking a look at an example of buckling. Uh, as I always tell you, remember to buckle up. Uh, all right, well, let's get back to our notes on buckling. So we know that for our examples, uh, well, we see that we can even find buckling examples in bridges. So whether they be the bridge columns or bridge beams or even the bridge braces or cross frames, as we call them. We're not restricted to just bridges, of course. I mean, I love steel bridges. I could go on for hours about them. But of course, when it comes to building design, we also see compression members that can experience buckle, like our columns, even braces in building design. Uh, these elements will all have compression loading. I want to label the three pictures in the middle here as to what kind of buckling they experience. So the picture on the left, uh, we'll call that flexural buckling. Uh, with a single angle member, there's a lot of uh, intricacies in whether it's flexural or it might have a flexural and torsional mode. Um, they're very unique things, but for our understanding right now, let's call it flexural buckling. Then we saw with that tube shape, we saw that crinkle in the cross section, so that's local buckling. And then when we talk about beams, we really have to call it lateral torsional buckling. And so that's specific to beams because, of course, when a beam bends, we have like one flange going in the compression, one going in the tension. And so there's both a lateral movement and a torque in the cross section, hence lateral torsional buckling. Now, I have a note there, due to the various factors such as initial crookedness, load eccentricities, and load redistribution, um, buckling is a gradual process rather than all of a sudden. So if you ever watch a column buckle, it typically will not just be a sudden, oh my gosh, it buckled all of a sudden, you'll kind of see that motion happen. It's a gradual process. When we talk about compression members, we're talking about members that are subjected to primarily axial compression. So let's think. Where do we see just compression members, mainly compression members? So beams are not mainly compression members, so we'll throw them out for discussion another time. We saw in the example braces, braces in some of the struts have some just compression. We also know columns, that's kind of our go-to. Uh, and then if we remember back to statics, hopefully you remember trusses. Good old trusses have members that are either purely in tension or purely in compression. So that makes trusses a good spot to identify some compression members. When we talk about the failure modes, we list uh, these kind of failure modes. Uh, I want to focus here on just flexural buckling in our mechanics and materials class. So these are some of the other ones. If you take steel design class with me, I'll be happy to teach you all about all of these. Um, but for now, let's just talk about flexural buckling. Well, that wraps up our introduction on buckling. Uh, I hope you stick with me for the next video, and we'll see if our good old friend Leonard Euler can manage to convince the cop that he's of a stable mind.